Welcome to The Bill Walton Show, featuring conversations with leaders, entrepreneurs, artists and thinkers. Fresh perspectives on money, culture, politics and human flourishing. Interesting people, interesting things. Welcome back to The Bill Walton Show. We are in overtime talking about social media, uh, media, media bias and Donald Trump with Brent Bozell and Dan Gaynor of the Media Research Center. And we were just beginning to dig into what the big social media companies mean for speech, uh, for outcomes of elections, that sort of thing. Who wants to well, kick it off? The, let's, let's back up just a little bit to 2008, because 2008 was really when the social media companies started helping influence, being, being used to influence elections. And it's a good thing. I mean, it, it, it was advertising. Obama's uh, campaign was very smart in 2008, 2012. They helped social media, particularly Facebook, help them get elected. Then you get to 2016, and forget the Russian thing for a second. The reason why Donald Trump won 2016 is he had a very skilled use of social media. I mean, he is a one-man media outlet that journalists can't stand because he, the term we used to use in, in the Internet was he disintermediates them. They just need Good them. Lord. We use yeah. that? Yes. We, 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 that is a big just, word. He doesn't, <laughs> he doesn't need the press. It used to be the president's press secretary would have a press conference, and the journalist would then take that press conference and tell you what was important from it. Now he goes on Twitter and he tells you what's important, and they could ignore him completely, and 50 million people mm -hmm. still see it. So in 2016, when he'd used that and used Facebook to win, I, yeah, the, the, the press has been casting about trying to find a villain. And so it came out that Russia tried to influence the 2016 election. Well, if you read the Washington Post, they admit that Russia's been trying to influence every American election since 1960. They spent a little bit of money. As it turns out, they spent money on the far right and the far left, helping Bernie Sanders and such. And so the press has basically ginned this up into this, oh, my God, Russia helped Donald Trump win because it was such a close election. No, that's not the case. It's just not the case. The amount of money that Russia spent on the election was so tiny that in the billions and billions of dollars it spent on advertising for Facebook, it's not influential. But they've done that as a way of beating up the social media companies to make sure that they prevent it from happening I'm, again. You know, I'm not, I'm not concerned about Russia meddling in elections. I'm far more concerned about Russia or any of our other adversaries meddling to cause chaos in American society, which I think they're doing. Um, it, it didn't just happen overnight that, that uh, the left and the right has declared war uh, on, on each other. It didn't just happen where opposition has, has reached such a fever pitch that there's now violence in the streets, uh, which 10 years ago there wasn't. I, I do believe that there are forces that are out there beyond the American political forces that are throwing gasoline on, on, on these flames and stoking things. And you, we, are, we know evidence of it. It's come out of, of Russians uh, uh, you know, setting up these fake organizations on the Internet. Uh, that, to me, is far more frightening than what they might do in a, in a presidential election because a presidential election is politics. What I'm talking about is culture. And culture is something that spans uh, uh, generations. And that's where the play is. Where, where they're concerned. One other thing about the importance of social media, the last three presidential elections were decided by social media. Barack Obama put his eggs in the Facebook basket in 2008, mm -hmm. and he did it again in 2012. Trump did it in, in the Twitter basket in 2016. 2020 is going to be kind of interesting because I know the White House is playing. They're, 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 they're amassing different, different uh, uh, sandboxes that they're going to be playing in. Um, but it is social media. It's not CBS News anymore. It is social media that's the game changer. Well, and it's no secret that most of the people who work in the big social media companies are not big fans of Donald Trump. And it's no secret that they feel like 2016 got away from them. Yeah. And they're not going to let that happen again. And you look at what's happening, say, for example, to Dennis Prager, mm -hmm. who puts out his really wonderful five-minute videos, you know, YouTube is beginning to is beginning to put things on the, what they call their restricted list, which really dramatically reduces the kind of audience they have. And some of the videos are Israel's legal founding with Alan Dershowitz, 
you know, hardly a, a Trump guy. Um, why uh, don't feminists fight for Muslim women, women with Diane Hirsi Alley? Um, and are the police racist with Heather McDonald and on and on and on? These are these are not politically charged videos yet. History yet. of the Korean War is another one that was that was uh, problematic. So what's uh, what's, uh, what's 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 going on here? Well, well, well it, it is the left that is targeting success. Um, Dennis Prager has got about the most sophisticated online video operation uh, in the business. I've been on I've I've been on there, and I can tell you it is second to none how how professional it is. But he's got millions of people viewing him, and the far left sees him as a threat. And so what they've done is they've demonetized him. They haven't said he can't be on there. He just he just can't pay the bills uh, while he's on there. So I think he's kind of going the Hillsdale model. He's raising a lot of money because he can't raise money, um, and 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 it, he can't sell ads. So he's getting support. So he's getting. Yeah, I think he's doing very well. You know, knock uh, on wood. I hope I hope he's doing well. Um, but uh, uh, you know, if they can go against Dennis Prager. They can go against anybody, and I think that's their, that's the message that they're sending. If you veer from uh, from 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 the from the from the, the the far left narrative and their worldview, you will be banished from polite company. Well, it, 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 it verges on on parody. Uh, there was one that was banned on the Ten Commandments: What You Should Know, and it was banned. And they asked them why, and it says, "Well, you mentioned murder in it." Yeah, that came up during the Google hearing, that when Ted Cruz was asking <laughs> well, a representative of Google testifying in front of the U.S. Senate, and he said, well, it's because it mentions murder. Well, it's against murder. Yeah, you but, would but, generally but, think that might but, be a but good then, thing. But then Dennis Prager, I think, who was there, was yeah. he, on the, was he there he, testifying? Uh, anyway, I think he assured them their next video would be the Nine Commandments. <laughs> Wait, it is. It is, it is crazy, but no, how, how crazy is this world? And it is insane. But, but, but let's uh, you, keep stepping back to the fact that you get them able to do this, and if they do well, it to yeah, Dennis, well, let, they can do it well, to anybody. Okay, okay, let's put this in perspective. Um, why, is this, why is this important? Uh, I, I'll, I'll make the argument. What we're looking at is the greatest threat um, of speech worldwide in the history of man. And that sounds pretty uh, uh, bombastic, but it's true that... Facebook now has an audience of 2.2 billion. Zuckerberg will tell you it's 3 billion. Um, uh, Twitter has hundreds of millions, and through them, billions. Um, Google controls 92% of search engines. Uh, uh, YouTube, 5 billion videos downloaded every day. And then you look at the service companies underneath them, whether it's Apple, whether it's Microsoft, whether you know PayPal and all these. I mean, this is a monster operation. And if you don't abide by their worldview, you're banished from this form, from this, from this world. Meaning, if you say things as a professor did, and, and people think we're making this up, it is not, we're not making this up. A, a liberal professor in Canada made the statement, a woman is not a man. She was banished from Twitter. This is, this is Jordan Peterson? No, 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 it's no, a woman. A woman, no, a woman said, it, but, but, okay, but he, yeah. he, has said, he has said the same thing. If you say a woman is not a man, you have violated things on, on Twitter, and, and you're banished. Now, what, so what if you're banished? Well, that means that you, can't com you cannot communicate on a worldwide platform that hundreds of millions of people get to use and that reaches billions of people. You're no longer allowed to do it. And anyone, anyway, next thing, think about the Catholic Church. Catholic Church is it, it's right. It is right for the Catholic Church to be banned from social media. And it's not just social media. I mean, Google is all media. Google gives you access to your website. Uh, we live in an era now where you cannot function in our society. You can't access your retirement accounts. You can't use your bank really. You can't do anything. Access all the great books in the world and you know, find out what's going on in the news unless you are online. And, and look, Google, your Facebook is talking about this Libra project where they're going to have online money, global money. But even they're not sure if they ban you, if they would already ban you already off their platform because you said something wrong. So this is, you can't function in our world unless you're online. And they have the ability to take you off Well, like that. let me give you another example. Jordan Peterson, who I mentioned, who's a very interesting intellectual. Uh, 
he 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 voiced some uh, objection to gender identity in in some bills and I think in a Canadian Parliament, right. and uh, he felt didn't feel like compelling speech transgender pronouns was was uh, was the right thing to do, and he said it. So Google they shut off his Gmail account, his YouTube account. They took his 260 videos off, which had 15 million views and 400,000 subscribers. He has no access to his mail and calendar data. And they claimed it was, uh, they blamed a machine, and then they put it in front of a couple of people, and they said, well, they agreed with the machine, and they gave no reason. Um, so now I think somehow he's got himself back in business, but we did a study about, on, on the, Dan, Dan uh, uh, commandeered the study a couple of years ago, looking at these complaints uh, about these tech companies to mm -hmm. see, you know, we're hearing a lot of people complaining about them. What, how, how many of these complaints are accurate and how many of them aren't? We looked at 28 of them. And uh, he, he, I mean, we, we followed his lead on this. Uh, the conclusion was that five of them were just simply not true. Um, the, the, those, those conservatives complaining about it didn't know what they were talking about or whatever the reason might be. In nine cases, and, 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 and Dan bent over backwards on this one, in nine cases we were unwilling to, uh, to say that, the, that this was censorship. If Facebook took your, a conservative site down and the conservative complained and Facebook put it back up, the post, that didn't necessarily mean that it was taken down because you were a conservative. It could have been a glitch. But in 50% of the cases, in 14 out of the 28, they had absolutely censored conservatives. And here's the and here, here's something to ponder. They will Twitter will deny that it shadow bans anybody. Well, they do shadow ban. It's not true. They do shadow ban. And then they say, well, you know, it's it's not targeted at anybody. The only people on Capitol Hill that have been shadow banned are members of the House Freedom Caucus. I don't know. Maybe Who it's knows? coincidence. Maybe, Maybe it's just coincidence. A coincidence. You're watching the Bill Walton Show. I'm here with Brent Bozell and Dan Gaynor, and we're talking about social media and the potential of social media censorship. Well, you look, you know, everybody's talking about censorship, and everybody says, oh, Twitter doesn't censor. One of the things you can tell is how they handle the thing they're supposed to be most concerned with, threats of violence, you know, I mean, absolute harassment that women get on social media. And there's a lot of talk about it because it happens a lot on Twitter. No person on Twitter, no man or woman, gets harassed, sexually abused, threatened, etc., more than Dana Lash. I've never seen anything like it. And it takes, it takes almost a concerted effort by the conservatives on Twitter to get any of it taken down. They just don't pay attention to it. They treat it like she deserves it. And, that's, and so it's just the venom that the left piles on her. And so... Yes, we know the fix is in. You, you, you'll see a conservative, conservatives who posted that, that T. Mitch uh, story were, were actually a threat against the Senate majority leader, and they're told to take it down. The, the, this was the Antifa group yeah. protesting in front of his uh -huh. house, saying we need to strangle that scrawny neck, and we need to put a knife in his heart. Mm -hmm. And that, they, had that, they had that on video. He posted a blank, that, blank person. and, and mm -hmm. Twitter yanked it because... But first, they said they were trying to protect him. Mm -hmm. And Antifa is protected on Facebook. I mean, they, they, they're, not, they're not removed. Um, look at the double standard that we have going on right now. Uh, the, after two Israeli soldiers were murdered, the son, ben, uh, ben not, Netanyahu's son, called these Palestinians monsters. He was suspended. But along, uh, while he's being suspended, Hezbollah and Hamas, which are dedicated to the eradication of the state of Israel, remain, uh, as does the uh, Iranian imam, who is also called for the, for the wiping Israel off the face of this earth. So the, the, it, it is, it's, it's breathtaking, it's astonishing to see how these sites have the audacity to say they are doing things for the social good, mm -hmm. and they have some kind of a, of a, a well-intentioned justice in mind, and Google do good and all that, while giving, allowing the most horrific terrorist operations in the world to thrive, while banning conservatives for saying, I repeat, a woman is not a man. 
Well, you can still find you know, Hamas, Hezbollah, both of which are considered terrorist organizations by the U.S. government. You can find them on social media. It's astonishing to me. And they say, well, they're legitimate government entities or something. They're terrorist organizations. Why can't we, you know, we see this big push to go after, restrict this type of speech or that type of speech. And now the president's actually talking about an executive order on speech. But they will let enemies of this country have, have complete access and say whatever they want. It, you may, it's you astonishing. Know, you may just, just hit me. You and I were attending the same meeting some months ago where Dennis Prager gave an extraordinary address. Mm -hmm. And he pointed out how he and Alan Dershowitz, uh, who don't see alike on anything, uh, have such, you know, they're, 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 they're not just Jews, but they're intelligent Jews. And they have seen, a, a, he, he, he quotes Alan Dershowitz as saying, my enemy is not the conservative movement. It's the far left. And that is the threat. He under, Dershowitz understands the fundamental threat to freedom posed by them. And he also understands the power. This is, a, you know, uh, Jim Kirkpatrick, used to, the former ambassador of the UN, used to talk about those powers that existed outside of the checks and balances in the United States. You had big business in the 1930s. Then you had big labor. Uh, that, but now what you've got is social media. They are every bit as powerful as the other three arms of the, of the American government to change public policy. They can decide who does and who doesn't well, get elected and, president. And, and, and they are, they have a very strong point of view. I mean, you've trained the Media Research Center guns on traditional media and analyzing what their point of view is. You've done the same thing on the social media companies, and mm -hmm. I can't go through chapter and verse, but you've identified really where their positions and all the important issues of the day. Well, look at, look at what Dr. Robert Epstein said. And he said he's done more analysis to this scientifically. You know, so you're looking at social science way, or looking at Google. And he says that Google impacted the election, 2016 election, not talking about you know, 2020. But before we get into Epstein, I do oh, want to okay. talk about him next. I want to talk about what, well, is, what, what is the evidence of their bias? Well, the evidence of their bias is simple. Look at what they say. They, they all have these, these so-called content rules or hate speech rules. So on Facebook, you're not allowed to talk about, not even allowed to make a moral choice, moral, moral commentary on somebody. So, which is the foundation of, as we all know, a, a lot of the conservative movement. They set up rules where you can have infinite genders you know, you even get self-defined gender on, on I think, Facebook. I think, I think they have 123 gender but, choices. Was, but you can, you've got to fill in the blank now on Facebook. You can actually say what you what you are if, that, if you don't like any of the ones. Uh, and so so there's that. The, the That's up, really questioning. When you're given 100 <laughs> options and you still don't know. Yeah, you'll see them talk about, you know, all the different protected classes in different groups. Because when you talk to these social media companies, Freedom is not their foundational belief. Safety is. And so they want all these different groups to feel safe. So if something I say criticizing illegal immigration makes illegal immigrants on their platform feel unsafe, they're going to take it off because that's one of their protected groups. You've got a whole long list of protected groups and, and views about content. Twitter the same, the same way. So, and then you look, who do they deal with to enforce all this? Well, they've all dealt with the Southern Poverty Law Center or Anti-Defamation League, both of which the current ADL, not the old ADL, the current ADL is after the conservative movement, just as the SPLC is. And so their goal on the left is to remove, or the word is deplatform, anybody who disagrees with them. Well, you know, I think there's a, mis a fundamental misunderstanding of what these companies see themselves to be. We would like to think that they are American companies that aren't abiding by basic rules of, of, of behavior uh, 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 in the United States. But they don't see themselves as American company. They see themselves as members of the world community. As members of the world community, they look to see what Literally, what in the world do we like? And what they're looking at is a European model that puts virtue over freedom. Virtue is defined by what you define virtue to be, but it puts virtue over freedom 
whereas the American model puts freedom over virtue. And in the American model, you're guided by the Constitution. In the world model, the Constitution doesn't apply. Therefore, if you ask them to roundly, publicly, unequivocally endorse the First Amendment, they won't. Ask them to endorse the Second Amendment, they won't, because they don't believe in it, because they're not being guided by that. They're being guided by a very different set of standards. Yeah, I agree. We talked about this before. We wanted to make freedom our, our, our shining word. And even in America, freedom is losing. It's, it's not the coin it used to be. I mean, you say it now. A lot of young people really don't think freedom is more important than, say, equality or any other outcomes that they choose. So we're, we're, uh, we're not on the side of that. Uh, you're watching the Bill Walton Show. I'm here with... Uh, um, you say Ronald Bozell. Reagan? <laughs> Ronald Reagan, uh, Brent Bozell, and Dan Gaynor. We'll bring and, him another uh, chair. We're talking about the, the very real likelihood that there's a lot of political bias at the big social media companies. Uh, let's shift gears. I don't want to get too wonky, but there's a something called the Communications Decency Act that was passed in 1996. Six. And at the time, it was there was the, the internet companies were small and they were trying to protect them. And they didn't want them to be in litigation the whole time, so they did a carve out. And the carve out was something called Section 230, and somebody's written a book called The 26 Words That Created the Internet. And what it says is uh, uh, no provider or user of an interactive, interactive computer service shall be treated as a publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. So that means something coming through Google even if it's a, or no, let's say Facebook, even though it might be offensive, that's not Facebook's problem. But then the act also had something else in there that they're also required to police their, their, their content for offensive material, and that wasn't defined. Right. And now they're defining that as stuff that's politically not aligned with what they think ought to, ought to be happening. Yeah, in this essence, it said you can't sue them because for anything that you, because it's all user generated content. So they're just common carriers. You can't sue them for the content. And they're supposed to, you know, they have the ability to edit what they want, what they think is offensive. <clears throat> and sure, there are a lot of things. I mean, if, if, if someone posted a snuff film on Facebook, I think we would, you know, reasonable people would consider that to be offensive, you know, that someone's killed for real in the film. But where, where they change now is, their very globalist and very liberal worldview, their anti-gun, their pro-abortion, their, you know, go down the line of, they're almost pro-socialist in some ways on a lot of these sites. And that's their worldview. So now what they want to do is remove it from, from their sites to the point where it's not just the major companies that we talk about, but you see it in the support companies like PayPal or even Pinterest, which is a, pretty much a, a, a scrapbooking website where you just post photos of things it, it, you it, like. Isn't there a knitting website? Yeah, that's, Ravelry, uh, hmm. Ravelry has the same problem. And so, so we're going to just ban conservatives or, or Republicans or pro-Trump people, whatever you wanna, group you want to say, from the entire online world, and we're going to use Section 230 to do it. Well, see, see, here's think think uh, think Wikipedia. Wikipedia um, has been sued by entities in the past that believe that they were libeled because people were putting libelous information on Wikipedia. Wikipedia defended itself as being a platform, and they are they're, they're the simple platform on which others post material, and in fact. Um, they, they, they won that case based on Section 230. Take away that protection from them. Take away that protection from Facebook and those other companies. And now suddenly those companies will be liable for what's on their platforms. Mm -hmm. And that is why the, uh, men like Mark Zuckerberg bent over backwards to talk about their sites being a free, an open marketplace of ideas. If it's not, they are in deep, deep guacamole. And what's happening is that there is this growing uh, you know, avalanche of evidence that they are anything but a free marketplace of ideas. And therefore, you take away that Section 230 carve-out, that protection that they have, and suddenly, if there is 
you know, if if a, if a, if a, uh, if, if if a Dennis Prager is uh, is not allowed to to uh, have a a uh, uh, commercial enterprise, uh, he's going to sue and he's going to win. Oh, he is um, suing. Uh, he is suing. Uh, but he, he, he we, I believe, you take away that Section two thirty, and he's got and he's got a, a, an so, open field. So, so when when people start hearing about Section two thirty. Pay attention, because that's really the heart of the matter. Yeah, there are two issues. There are two issues that, that I think we have to look at. That I think the two vulnerabilities that they have are Section 230, and then there's antitrust. And, and where antitrust uh, issues are concerned, you know, there's some, a lot of conservatives that say, oh, wait a minute, we, know we're, we don't want, want, want government meddling. In fact, in fact, if you have monopolies, we as conservatives absolutely want this to happen because we believe in free markets. And if you don't have a free market, if you can't compete against these monsters, and I don't know that you can, but if you can't, then you've got to break them up. So those are the two things that has uh, that tech uh, uh, world sweating bullets right now. Yeah, that's the thorny issue because people said the same thing about IBM. They said the same thing about Microsoft. They said the same thing about... Right. steel and right. so on and so forth and what happens is somebody in a garage or whatever invents something new and all of a sudden what was proprietary and only google isn't but you know here here's here's the, the here's going to be the challenge there if you want to to compete you have to work in the marketplace uh, that that allows competition to communicate when that marketplace is controlled by your competitor, it can be made impossible for you to exactly. compete. Exactly. Well, that's why I like the 230 focus, because I think if we make them publishers as opposed to conduits, they're not responsible for content, then they can be sued. Mm -hmm. And then you open it up to a very interesting world of people being able to defend themselves. Yeah. Let's talk about Google before we run out of time. You mentioned Robert Epstein. Mm -hmm. Robert Epstein's done a lot of work, and he's not a Republican, he's not a conservative. He's done a lot of work on the, Google's ability to manipulate search results. And he did some tests. He's, uh, yeah, he's done extensive tests. What he did, what he concluded was that Google was able to influence at least 2.4, I think it is, or 2.6 million votes in the 2016 election. And that's the baseline. And he says there's up to 15 million votes in, at risk in the 2020 election because he showed statistically how they were able to take neutral people and make them 90 percent all on one side just he, by, by appearance of where things show up on your and, search. You know, all of us that look at Google, they say there are three ways they can manipulate us. They've got a list effect, which is you'll Google something, a list will come up. Something at the top of the list gets mm -hmm. gets priority. People don't even look at the second page. Very few people. Um, about five percent of people click past it. Then there's the auto fill in function. You start typing something in, and it leads you to a where it wants to take you. And then there's the box, and they've got the Google boxes, which is the with the sponsored content. Yeah. So here's mm -hmm. so, but here's one of the problems. Uh, unlike old media, we can all turn on CNN and see how biased it is. We can all laugh at Chris Cuomo for for a couple minutes but we're all getting the same information. On Facebook or Google or whatever, we're all getting different information. It's tailored to us, so to, to monitor this becomes a massive task. This is why I commend the efforts he's done. And this is why the left says, well, see, you can't prove, oh, that they're biased. Well, because they work with a black box. We don't see how many hundreds of times in a year that Google changes its algorithm. We don't see how many people that they showed their Hey, go out, go out and vote reminders. You know, you, you, it's, it's, a, it's an irony that I have said, and maybe Dan, is, Dan, Dan was with me, uh, where we sat in a room with top executives from Google who looked at us in the eye and said, no, absolutely, we do not. You cannot touch our algorithm. Oh, no, 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 no. One does not do that. At the same time, the head of, of uh, you, you might remember her name, the head of a Latino uh, for oh, Google no. operations, the, in a leaked memo, apologized to the chairman, to the founder of Google for not delivering the Latino vote for Hillary Clinton in the 2016 campaign. I don't know. One just doesn't work with the other doesn't one very well. On the one hand, on the other. <laughs> well, the, 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 the really frightening part of it is, is the people who were being manipulated 
no one had any idea that there was bias. So you say you look at CNN, you can see bias. Evidently, in these church results, people don't see. That's the frightening part. That's the frightening part. Right, because I mean, you. They say your search results are geared toward you. They're geared toward geography. They're geared toward you know what people are searching for the most. So you can type in because we did this this morning, Mitch McConnell's address, not punch in the actual address, just those three words, Mitch McConnell's address, and it show, pops up with his with his home address in his in his house. If somebody now, wanted to, yeah. If some look, if somebody wanted to, let's get let's cut to the chase with Bill Walton. If somebody wanted to manipulate your information. What they could put on your front page, if somebody types in Bill Walton, is is 10 left-wing organizations denouncing Bill Walton. Now, uh, they may accurately be reflecting, uh, you know, taking you right to the site, and everything is above board where the person clicking on Bill Walton is concerned if that person knows nothing about Bill Walton. But if that person wants the truth about Bill Walton, well, it might be on page four. But what they saw was what the left had to say about him. And that's how it's done. We've seen it happen with conservative groups. You know, if you, at one point, if you typed in the Republican Party um, uh, of California, you got, I think you got Adolf Hitler. You, 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 it, was, you, it, was, it, was, it was the Nazi group, yes. Well, yeah, that was the guy from Google who was fired, who tried to fix that at Google, where if you type in, Trump's new book, instead of finding his book, you found Mein Kampf. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, that, and it and took him nine months to get that changed. But even the Real Columbia quickly, well, you're watching the Bill Walton show. I'm here with Brent Bozell and Dan Gaynor. We're talking all things social media. We're in overtime. We're going to take just a couple more minutes to wrap up. But uh, anyway, well, Dan, continue. Point. The Columbia Journalism Review, I think it was, that did a study of uh, who, show, who gets linked on Google News. And it was... 20, the top 20, there was only one that didn't lean left. And even by their analysis, not ours, it was five to one liberal to conservative. And that's why, and that's why people have to, have to really focus on the fact that this is more than the, than the big tech companies. It, it, it is Google. I mean, it is Apple. It is Microsoft. With mm -hmm. their news guard, it is PayPal that doesn't let you do business if you're a Christian organization um, on on their sites. It is more and more of these second tier companies that are getting into the act because it's the same people out in Silicon Valley. It's the same world, and they're all kind of enabling each other and emboldening each other to go the next step, the next step, the next step, and that's the frightening part. And then you see certain outlets, and CNN is the worst of all of them to do this. They'll contact and harass these social media companies until they until they remove somebody, until they remove to move a site. Or well, how come it's still on there? If you analyze that, I heard anecdotally they will. The media companies will respond to CNN, but they won't respond to somebody from the right. Yeah, I mean, I've seen. Is it that true? I've certainly seen examples where they respond to CNN. We've we've interacted a lot, and Brent and I have both have interacted with a lot with these social media companies. Yeah. And so I think they respond to us. But the the reality is, when CNN sits, goes into a press conference and says, "How can we ever remove this guy?" and they keep at it, or they tweet about it and post it, they they respond and they end up removing stuff. We've seen it. That's how Alex yeah. Jones yeah. got nuked. That's right. It's a, it's a, Alex Jones is the exact example yeah. of that. It was a CNN reporter that harassed and harassed and harassed and harassed until it happened. It was interesting. We as conservatives, at the same time, were saying, what about Louis Farrakhan? Um, why is he on these sites? And it took forever until they finally removed him. Hmm. You know, if they were going to be fair, if they were going to be civic about it, this man who calls, you know, anti-termite, whatever he calls Sam, uh, 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 calls them termites, this man would have been, would have been uh, uh, thrown off those platforms years ago. And yet he remained, but it took conservatives screaming and yelling before he got, got taken off. Okay, at this point, I need reason for hope and optimism. Well, if you were a Catholic, you would you would <laughs> know that hope is a mortal sin, so you don't want to go to hell. Okay, um, no, no, I'm not a Catholic. I always, always, always have faith in the American spirit. I always have faith in the American spirit uh, that America ultimately does the right thing. My favorite quote for, for '90s music is "All is not lost, not yet." <laughs> okay last words brent dan thank you thanks for joining us on the bill walton show uh, another fascinating episode hope we'll get you guys back to dig into this absolutely more. thanks thank Great. you thank you thanks for listening want more 
Be sure to subscribe at thebillwaltonshow.com or on iTunes. 